In the year 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians after an 18 month long siege. Once the Babylonians controlled the city, they deported most of the leading citizens to exile in Babylon and set up a military control over the southern kingdom of Judah. Now there were resistance fighters who carried on the war hoping to overthrow the new rulers as well as the foreign governor who had been left behind to assume command. The Babylonian military official at this time, his name was Gedaliah, and soon after the siege, he and a party of his men were ambushed by Jewish guerrilla fighters and they were killed. Of course, this was against God's will because through the prophet Jeremiah, God had told the people to comply with their new rulers. Now after the plot was discovered by Jewish civilian leaders, they became very afraid of the retaliation that the Babylonians would visit upon them, so they began planning an escape to Egypt. But before they escaped, they went to seek counsel from the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 42, uh, what has just been read, we see the story based on the question that we are raising and discussing this morning. Now as for Jeremiah's answer, he said not to go. He told them to remain in Judah, not escape to Egypt, stay in Judah and God would protect them. And I hear the, you know, as, as Paul was reading the flowery answer that they gave to Jeremiah, oh boy, you tell us the answer, we'll listen to the answer, and oh, God is great and wonderful, and just tell us what we have to do, because we're going to do it, and God is great, and you're His servant, and boy, we're ready to do what He wants. So Jeremiah tells him, okay, don't go to Egypt, don't escape, stay in Judah, because God will rescue you. And so what did they do? Uh, they went to Egypt. <laughs> they packed up and escaped and they went to Egypt. Now eventually the Babylonians returned, of course, to defeat the Pharaoh in Egypt and they also took care of business with those Jews that has escaped as well. Now there's a good lesson here about being very careful and obeying God's word and trusting His strength but that's not the lesson I want to preach. I want us to focus on verse seven. It's just at the tail end there. In verse seven it says, 10 days later, the Lord gave His reply to Jeremiah. Jeremiah prays, what's the answer? What do you want them to do, Lord? And then 10 days after that prayer, God answers. Isn't it amazing that even though Jeremiah was a good and a faithful servant of God, even though he was an experienced prophet, even though God knew the answer, Jeremiah had to wait 10 full days for a word of prophecy. Seems to me that God could have just as well revealed the message to Jeremiah on day one as day 10. And yet he chose to make Jeremiah persevere in prayer. That's my point. That's my lesson. You know, we find ourselves in similar positions today. We're asking God over and over again for certain answers, certain things to happen. But he makes us persevere in prayer. He encourages us to keep on praying a long time before an answer finally comes. You know, I believe that there are several good reasons why God does this, and I'd like to share a couple of those with you today. So why keep on praying? Why persevere in praying? Well, number one, because waiting is good discipline. Waiting is good discipline. When our prayers are not answered right away, it means we have to wait. And waiting upon the Lord is a good spiritual exercise. Note what Isaiah says 
are the benefits of waiting upon the Lord in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 27. The writer says, why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. He is, his understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Now you need to, you need to understand that the person that Isaiah is writing about in this verse thinks that God does not hear his prayers. He thinks that God is unaware of his problems. He is tired of waiting. He is growing impatient in his waiting. And Isaiah explains what the discipline of waiting upon the Lord will do for him. Waiting helps an individual grow strong and overcome his enemies, whoever those enemies are, whatever those enemies might be. Isaiah reminds this tired and impatient person that God is not like him. He does not get tired or impatient when things don't happen right away. As Christians, you know, we, don't, we don't depend on exercise or yoga to create spiritual poise or a calm and trusting exterior. It's waiting on the Lord that builds those kinds of things. We all want those kinds of things. We all want poise. We all want strength. We all want to be immovable spiritually. We all want that, but we don't want to do the exercise that creates that within us. When our petitions are not immediately answered and we exercise a period of prolonged prayer, let's remember that time spent waiting on the Lord is never wasted, never wasted. Why keep praying? Number two, well maybe we're not ready to understand God's will yet. You know, I used to have my own formula to successful and fast acting prayer, a little bit like Alka-Seltzer, you, know, you put them into the water, psh, they start to fizz right away. That fizz, by the way, is nothing. That's just marketing. It's to make you think that it's working. That's all it is. So my system you know, was, well, believe that God can do it. You know, pray believing. Number two, ask clearly and specifically. You know, be specific with God. Number three, ask in Jesus' name. And number four, be ready to receive no as an answer. I got it down. You know? It was like a safe combination. You know? If I could get all of these little ducks in a row, it would be like buying something from a vending machine. You make the right selection, you put in the right change, hit the button, bingo, you get your candy. Of course, these things are correct. You need to believe and you need to put your needs before the Lord and you need to do it in, you know, in Jesus' name with faith in Christ, of course. However, there was one element I did not consider in those days and that was if God thought that I was ready or the time was ready yet for that prayer to be answered. I never considered that. You know, Abraham and Sarah desired and prayed for a child most of their married life, but the prayer was answered only when she was 90 years old. Now both she and Abraham were not ready in matters of faith when they first began to act. The fact that she had a child at 90 years of age served God's purpose better than if she had had a child when she was 19. Now she could have at 19, but the birth at 19 would not have created the glory that it did when she had it at 90. You know, Paul the Apostle desired in his prayers and in his strategy to go to Asia to preach the gospel. And the Bible tells us that God blocked it, prevented it, limited it, thwarted his plans, and refused his prayers in this thing. 
Why not answer my prayer, Lord? Look at all those people, nobody out there. But Paul didn't realize that by going west instead of east, he would establish the church in the dominant culture of the future, something he could not have known when he made that prayer. Because Christianity went west instead of east, it became the largest organized religion in history. So when we pray and when we say that we are ready to accept God's will, we must be ready that it be radically different than our own will. It's important to persevere in prayer because if we do, God will not simply answer the prayer, He will also reveal His will to us. And believe me, that is much more important. Thirdly, we need to persevere in prayer because prayer and perseverance in it reveals the quality of our faith. James says, I will show you my faith by my works, James 2.18. Now when we read this, we usually think of good works, you know, things that we do to help other people or living a holy and dedicated lifestyle, and that's correct, but it's not complete. Prayer is also a work of faith. You know, to direct our words to Christ, this is faith. To believe that Christ hears and answers, this is faith. To continue to do so over and over again and to wait patiently for an answer, this is showing that our faith is sincere. This is a work of faith. That we pray to God in Jesus' name shows that we believe the right things in the right way but that we continue to do so, that we persevere in it, is a way of showing that our belief is not only accurate, but it is strong, and it is real, and it goes much deeper than just our lips. Sometimes God leaves us in prayer for a very long time because the testing and the shaping of our faith is more important than the answering of our prayer. In other words, we need building up spiritually more than we need the thing we're praying about. And perseverance in prayer is the spiritual exercise that does that. You know, a good example of this is Paul's constant prayer to God to remove that thorn you know, in the flesh that he was suffering from, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, we never find out what the thorn was, and until that moment, Paul says that God had not answered his prayer. However, Paul's persistent prayer had helped him grow in faith to the point where he was ready to suffer with this thorn regardless of the answer that he got. When we become bored repeating our prayers at mealtimes or prayers during worship, when we become discouraged when our prayers are not answered the way we want or not answered at all, we need to remember an important reason for persistent prayer. It is more important that we are faithful people than a people whose prayers are always answered or answered quickly. Persevering in prayer may not always produce a satisfying answer, but it is always a sign of a sincere faith. And when Jesus returns, it won't matter what we're praying about so long as He finds us persevering in it. Now, Prayer is like every other exercise, whether physical or spiritual. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And if you're going to persevere, then I want to finish out my lesson by giving you a few pointers to help you in your persevering prayer life. First of all, let's remember to focus on God and not on what you want. You know, the most precious benefit of constant prayer is the fellowship that we have with the Lord. If your focus is only on the thing that you want, then you're missing the point. Jesus says that God knows what you want and need before you even ask for it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, uh, verse 8. The purpose of prayer is not to continue to describe and request what you want. The purpose of prayer is to draw you closer to God, to know Him and to know His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says that if we seek His kingdom, in other words, His will in our lives, if we seek that first, He will grant us everything we need. 
The great benefit of persevering in prayer is that we develop a relationship with God, not that we finally get what we need. And I can speak to that point uh, personally. In, in, in my life of faith, it's been the relationship. I can't remember the things that He answered, but I am always aware of the relationship that I have with Him. Number two, remember that it's about submission, not repetition. Submission, not repetition. And a lot of people think that the thing to be accomplished in persevering prayer is to repeat every day what it is that you want. Two times a day, that's good. Three times, good, better. Five times, super. But Jesus says they suppose that they will be heard for their many words, Matthew 6 and 7. In speaking of those who thought that their prayers were effective because they repeated them over and over and over again, or they were very flowery or elaborate. The goal of prayer is surrender, not repetition until you get what you want. In Luke 11:5, 5, Jesus tells the parable of the person who wakes up his friend at midnight to borrow some bread because of some visitors. The repeated knocks on the door in the middle of the night were a sign that this man had surrendered all of his reserve and pride and was willing to lower himself to disturb his friend because of his need, and his need was so great. You know, there's no magic number of repetition when we get what we ask for after asking, what, 10 times, 1,000 times? To exercise, or rather the exercise of constant prayer should enable us to give up our lives, to surrender our wills to God as we lay ourselves open before Him. It's as if we open the portals of our hearts and minds and wills and emotions and memories and imaginations for Him to enter and to fill. John Powell in his book, Happiness is an Inside Job, says that God communes with us through all of these things. Constant prayer sees us surrendering our lives bit by bit to God who will provide all of the things that we need, including the things we ask for or the ability to live without the things we ask for. So submission in prayer yields greater blessings than repetition in prayer. And then finally, remember the peaks and the valleys. Be ready for mountaintop experiences where the presence of the Lord is almost palpable, where His word is so rich, so convicting, His will for your life so clear that your time in prayer will leave you breathless. And the only thing stopping you from continuing in that moment is your own weak flesh. Of course, these prayer times are separated by many, many hours of dry reading and times where you think you're really just talking to yourself in prayer. We shouldn't be discouraged. Even the apostles who were physically with Jesus spent many hours simply walking the dusty roads from town to town or rowing across the Sea of Galilee to get to the next occasion. The time of uninterrupted fellowship in a glorious setting will come when Jesus returns. But for now, we must persevere in prayer and await those times that the Holy Spirit fills us with insight and holy encouragement from the Lord. But we will never know those moments if we do not persevere in prayer. And so the title of this sermon is, Why Keep Praying? because I assume all of us are already doing this on a regular basis, especially during this month of prayer that we're emphasizing this month. So if you're not praying or you're only praying once in a while, you're simply limiting your spiritual growth and the blessings that come with constant faithful prayer. There are a lot of things that come with hard work and talent, drive, dedication, but these things will not produce spiritual balance or understanding of God's will, or will they produce a strong faith. Only constant prayer gives you these things. If these things are missing in your life, perhaps it's, it's time to renew your prayer life before God. 
Of course, now is a great time to do this because as a congregation, as I said, we're focusing on the spiritual discipline of prayer this month. So if you haven't already done so, here's some things to do to jumpstart your prayer life. You know, get one of the prayer calendars and start the daily prayer guide that it provides. Or install the, you know, the Remind app on your phone, just ask Celestia so you can receive daily prayer reminders sent to your phone. And check out the videos and the comments and the prayers uh, and the requests on our church website, ChoctawSaints.org. Boy, I've watched a couple of those videos and I just get a lump in my throat when I, I, I listen to what the sisters are saying and the brothers are saying about prayer. Marvelous, so edifying. And I encourage all of you to commit or to recommit yourself to a time of daily Bible reading and prayer. And don't be discouraged if you're not able to develop that habit overnight. It takes time and effort and self-discipline, but the rewards are great. And finally, if this is the day that you have chosen to come to Christ in repentance and in baptism, or perhaps come back to Christ in repentance, then please make your way forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.